Hi everyone, it's Lynn Cremando for Yoga You Online, and I'm thrilled to be here today with Julie Goodmistad. Over the past 40 years, Julie has combined her training as a licensed physical therapist and her training as a Iyengar teacher to create her own anatomy-based training with the focus on musculoskeletal issues. Over the course of her career, she launched a school, the Goodness Dad Yoga School in Portland, Oregon. And in that uh, illustrious career, she has launched hundreds of teachers and thousands of students, um, brought them into yoga in a safe way. Uh, we at Yoga U are super pleased that Julie is one of our lead teachers in our brand new online 300 hour teacher training, which is why I'm excited, Julie, that you have taken some time to speak with me today. So welcome. Thank you. So it is a t kind of, I, I consider this kind of a crazy time in yoga because you can see classes for yoga with the word yoga and the word boot camp or <laughs> the word, you know, <laughs> yoga and where people are doing very extreme forms of yoga. Um, and I think from what my work as a yoga therapist said, yoga injuries are on the rise. And I know that your approach to teaching is a very careful and measured approach. And part of it is this concept that you've, I've heard you speak about before, which is termed prep for. Yes. And uh, so what I'm hoping is that before we dive into what I really want to talk about, you will talk about this prep for approach. Yeah. Well, I think that there's a couple of elements that brought me to that little phrase. Um, one is that I actually was involved in yoga before I became a physical therapist. And one of the reasons that I went to PT school was so that I could learn about how the body works, how the body gets injured, um, what are optimal alignments uh, for, for good health. And um, my goal became that I wanted to make yoga accessible to people of all ages and all abilities. Um, because I strongly believe that yoga is, is such an important and powerful healing discipline that I wanted to make it available even to people who may not be athletic or um, be fast learners in their body. So um, as a yoga student and then teacher, um, and having gone to physical therapy school, I um, saw that in physical therapy, we're presented with a problem. Somebody can't walk, they can't uh, raise their arm, they have some problem that's gonna Im impede their function. And so our job as the therapist was to kind of back up and figure out what elements do we need to work on? How, how can we set the stage so that the person can return to function with their gait or their spine or their shoulder or whatever we were working on. So that was, that's something that comes along with PT training is um, how to evaluate what's missing, what are the missing pieces, and then give those in bite-sized uh, bite pieces to people so that they will then be able to work um, without hurting, without hurting or re-injuring themselves, they'll be able to work and build up back to whatever function they need. And so then, as I started teaching yoga more and more, I would look at a pose that was a very challenging pose, uh, like headstand or some of the big back bends or the arm balances. Um, and I would think, now, what skills do we need to develop to be able to work towards that? And so for some people coming to yoga for the first time that were very deconditioned, uh, maybe they've never been active, they've never been athletic, or they've had an injury or an illness that set them back. So how can we get them going in a practice that's appropriate for them and prepare them for 
um, if they want to go on and do these more advanced poses. Not everybody does. Some people are perfectly happy to do very, very gentle practice. Their main focus is relaxation. Um, but not everybody can just jump in and start playing around with some of these very challenging poses. It's really fun when you're in your 20s and you're already in good shape um, or even athletic um, to, to go to boot camp and really push yourselves. But, and so that's fine for the people that works for, um, but there's a huge segment of our population that they would hurt themselves, they would get frustrated, they would feel overwhelmed, they'd feel stupid, and so they wouldn't go back. They wouldn't continue with yoga, and therefore, I think they're missing out on the wonderful benefits that, that appropriate practice would have for them. You know, that's so in line with the, I think the, if, if yoga you, if there was a philosophy for the work that we do and you do with us, it is that um, the poses aren't special. <laughs> the what's important is what's special what's important to the person is what's special yeah. and what you're saying is there isn't a category of pose that is off the table for someone you would just uh and part of it goes to these big mixed level classes which i think is an underlying problem with yeah. the yoga community is these big mixed level classes because that person you're describing might walk into a class and stand next to someone who's been practicing for 10 years. Yeah. And so it's not that the wheel or whatever it is is off the table. It's, it's that their wheel is not the same as that 10 year person's wheel. So I think what you're pointing to is it's been to me an inherent problem in the yoga community that anybody can walk in the door of a yoga studio of many yoga studios and walk into any class. I yeah. think these open drop in classes are, are not in best service. Well, in yoga. You're, you're either when you have very mixed levels. So you have beginners, brand new beginners with intermediate students, you're either going to overwhelm the beginners or you're going to um, bore the inner the strong intermediate students and it's i feel for people that are doing it with mixed level classes because i think it's really hard to find a medium where you don't lose either end of the spectrum they're they're those are hard to teach and sometimes they're unavoidable i'm not uh, you yeah. know i think they're also people yoga teachers are doing the best they can i mean they are not everybody has the ability I'm, I'm sympathetic because i think it's it's hard um it's not easy for the teachers and that we now have this model where people want to buy a pass and just drop into whatever and whenever yeah um, and to be honest that's why we developed our system where they sign up for a term and we have five different levels and and you go in with a group of people that have similar experience and abilities to you and then everybody kind of progresses along we can build things up together um, and so the, the intermediate students are doing headstands and back bends and the beginners are, are working on downward dog 101A. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned headstands because inversions is a category that is a little bit fraught to me because some students I think are afraid of them. Mm -hmm. They very correctly understand that they could get hurt badly doing inversions. Yes. Uh, some people want to try them, but they don't have the, uh, the foundation for them. Yeah. And they may or may not know that. And I know that when I was in my student days of going to studios and health clubs for yoga, that very often what would happen in the middle of class is the teacher would say, okay, we're going to go to the wall now. And we're going to do handstand yeah and kick up and if you can't kick up do an l and um it always felt so dangerous to me <laughs> so you know actually i could remember the first class 
I had already been doing yoga for a while, but I hadn't been doing handstands. And I can remember that first class where the teacher said, go to the wall and kick up. And I was like, and I was fairly young and fairly athletic. And I was like, what? You know, I haven't done a handstand since I was in the first right. grade, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I still remember it. I was so traumatized by it. <laughs> yeah. And yet, in your approach, in your courses, you don't eliminate any category of no. work. So what I'd like you to talk about is what you like about inversions and why they're a good part of a well-balanced practice. Yeah. Okay. So there's there's a lot of benefits to inversions. I think the thing that I appreciate the most about inversions is that they are said to be uh, balancing of our energies. Um, and in Iyengar yoga, which is where virtually all of my training has been, um, they're considered to be restorative poses. And so they are um, balancing of your energies, whether you come in stressed and frazzled and anxious or whether you're exhausted and lethargic, they are supposed to help balance your energies. Um, we often integrate them with other um, poses. So maybe we're mostly working on standing poses in a class, but then we would also do headstand and shoulder stand. We might do, be doing a, a back bending of whatever level, uh, more beginning back bends or advanced. And back bends are kind of stimulating and exciting and energizing, but, but then the inversions will help even that out. Or we might be doing a bunch of forward bends, which are very quieting and introspective. And again, the inversions will help balance out so that we are we are more level, we have energy, and yet we're also relaxed. Um, so being too relaxed in my mind equates to being lethargic and being too energized. People are sometimes frazzled and jumpy and um, so we want to balance that. And that's that's one part that the inversions can play is the energy balancing and that they are restorative. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other benefits are from the fact that we're reversing the effects of gravity. And so, for example, the way the internal organs are stacked up in your body, when we go upside down, it's going to change the way the blood flows around the organs and around the glands that are there in the center of your body. Um, there's also an interesting piece um, because they are scary for probably most people in the beginning when they're learning inversions. There's a wonderful sense of empowerment that can come from um, sticking with it and learning how to do them, even though they're scary and hard. Um, and so it's it builds people's confidence. And I think especially for, for women, uh, because lots of men have over time, they've continued to do some push-ups and some calisthenics. So they have, you know, they have confidence in their strength, but especially for women, but men also, um, that sense of having the, the strength, both of your mind and your body to pursue something that's challenging. And of course, if you look at the yamas and the niyamas, that is tapas, um, having the discipline will to continue um, even though something is very challenging and then to come out the other side having mastered it. Mm -hmm. I was also thinking when you were talking, you were talking about too much tamasic and too much rajastic and you yes. want to come to sattvic yes. uh, so that the inversions can help you be in a sattvic place. Can you just for the um, sake of conversation or, or, or clarification, uh, because inversions are not just headstand and handstand. Right. Can you define what's an inversion? What makes a pose an inversion? Well, an inversion is having um, at least part of your body above your heart. And I'm not talking about standing with your head above your heart. Mm -hmm. So having your legs would be the most obvious, having your legs elevated above your heart. Um, so 
in to my way of thinking, um, the very simplest inversion is to lie down flat on your back with your legs up the wall. Mm -hmm. That's an inversion. Mm -hmm. That's the beginning inversion. Um, and downward dog is an inversion. So it doesn't have to be where your whole body is completely upside down. Right. Um, so even having, you know, part of your body and downward dog, part of your body, um, your abdomen, your pelvis above your heart is a beginning inversion. And I recommend that people start with things like that um, because it's not a part of most people's, our Western lifestyle is not, it's not a regular part of people's life to spend some time lying down with their legs up the wall. Right. I, did fact, want to... I, I tried to give it to my mom once years ago. She had a lot of swelling in her feet. She was in her 80s. And I tried to get her to lie down and elevate her feet. Just a very simple, I mean, you can even do it lying on the couch with a stack of pillows on the end mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and your, your legs up. In physical therapy, that's how we sometimes elevate people, um, elevate their legs. Um, and she flatly refused to do it. It was just too weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did want to get that in there, though, because I, I wanted to um, make sure people know that if they're not going to do a headstand or a handstand, it doesn't mean they can't do an inversion. That's right. It doesn't mean they can't get that calming kind of sattvic yeah. state. Yeah. I, so I think of inversions as being on a continuum, you know, starting with lying down with your legs elevated above your heart. That's just about anybody can do that um, to long headstands with variations where you're putting your legs into full lotus while you're up in headstand. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are very challenging. Can I say they're very challenging poses? Yes, of course. <laughs> Um, and so there's a whole continuum in between, and hopefully people will take the time to to build up and get ready for those very challenging, you know, hand handstand, handstand variations, headstands. Yeah. So going back to that notion of the prep up, you know, the getting ready. Uh, four is what I usually say. Prep four. Prep four. There we go. Um, Someone who's a beginner who wants to aspire to, I know if they came to the formerly Good Miss Dad, I don't know, I know you sold your school, so I don't know if it still has your name on it. But if, well, if you Google, if you Google my name, you'll get there. It's Paxson Yoga Center now, the gal that works for me, Beth Paxson bought it, but yeah. Yeah, but if you had gone to your center uh, and you came in to, at level one, and you could see that there's, you know, ways to get there. What, what are the iterations? What are the beginning levels? I know you said lie on your back, but what do I need to do if I want to develop um, a practice with one of those more, you know, challenging, can I say, sexy? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm um, going full on handstand in the middle of the room. What is the seed that gets me <laughs> to that tree? So, are you talking about nuts and bolts? Uh, well, kind of. I, obviously, with that preparation that you talk about, you've got to build some foundational strength. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know if you meant motivating people to try it or if you no, meant I'm, I'm talking physical. about. Yeah, I'm talking about somebody who's motivated. They want to try it, but they're not conditioned. They're just yeah. at the baby step place. Yeah. So over the years, I have developed um, with, of course, lots of um, inspiration from my own teachers, but I have developed a, a progressive series um, to get people ready for inversions. And our beginners don't even know that they're starting on heading eventually to headstand and shoulder stand. And many of our beginners are older people or um, they've had some injuries and they don't aspire to do inversions, but they're, everybody is getting the groundwork um, 
whether they know it or whether they need it or not, because it's just part of a good overall um, conditioning for their body. So, um, for example, weight bearing on your arms is something um, that people need to develop the strength before they're gonna be able to do any of the inversions. They have to develop some strength and some flexibility in their upper body, not only the shoulder, but the whole shoulder girdle that supports the shoulder blade. Um, and we start that with downward dog with the hands on the chair seat. So instead of having downward dog with the hands on the floor like this, we put the hands up on a chair seat so the person looks like this. There's much less weight on the wrists, the arms, the shoulders, the shoulder girdle, but it is starting the strength work. And so we would go with the hands, so we hold the hands on the sides of the seat of the chair, that's a dog pose. And then we would have them come forward into plank with the hands on the chair and then back and forth dog to plank. And then eventually as, as they get stronger, they're no longer quivering and shaky, then we could move to the floor and do those. Um, so that's developing the strength. We do lots of shoulder opening things, both the overhead and the opening back, which is what you need for shoulder stand. It's different than handstand and headstand, which need, need arms overhead. Um, and so we're practicing shoulder extension, opening the arms back. So we do a wide variety of upper body work and it's, it's most appropriate because a lot of women um, come to yoga and they never have been strong in their upper body. Um, maybe they walk or they run, um, but they never have, they don't have a, a kinesthetic history or a knowledge in their body of being strong in the upper body. And it's quite intimidating um, because they can't even hardly bear weight of, in a in a plank, you know, plank on with the hands on the chair. And so that's a bite-sized piece and people will stand up and they'll say, oh, I can do that. And to me, that's a good sign because that's the confidence building and they're likely to come back and see, well, what else am I gonna find out that I thought I couldn't do, but I actually can. And then that leads, as we go through our levels of classes, then we build on that strength. And um, so, you know, some men come to yoga with stronger upper bodies, but unless they have a history of being in gymnastics or um, something where they've kept their flexibility, they have strength, but they don't have the flexibility that they need for handstand, for example. They may not be able to get their arm, um, you know, they're strong, but this is all they can do with their arm and then that, that just doesn't work in a handstand to be upside down and not be able to get your not be able to get your arm close to straight in line with your body. Um, so it's we have a whole system by which we build build up not only for inversions but back bends and standing poses. We start with easy things and then build on that. Works I'm really. I would just sit sitting here thinking, I really appreciate the systematic nature of what you're saying, which it is like a plan. Mm -hmm. You have a plan yeah. for your students and they progress as they progress. Yep. And if they don't want to progress, they just stay in a level one or a level two class. We don't kick them out. We have people who've been in a level one class for decades. Mm -hmm. They're getting what they want. They're getting what they want. Yeah. Yep. And to me, I figure any yoga, you know, it doesn't yeah, have to be absolutely. advanced. It doesn't have to be advanced. It, it, because a lot of people, the asana is not the point for them. Yeah. They're coming for something else. They're not coming yep. to do a spectacular pose. Yep. Um, and I like to think that even though I don't deliver lectures on yoga philosophy, usually I don't, or, or the yamas or the niyamas, but, but they are embedded in the way we teach, in the way we practice. Um, so having compassion, um, being Self -compassion. honest. Self-compassion. 
Huh? Self-compassion too. Self-compassion. If it starts at home, if, if you can't figure out how to be compassionate with yourself, it's hard to feel that with other people, I think. But now how would I know if I don't live in Portland, I can't go to your school, I can't go to your prepping method. How do I know that I am safe as a student? Is there a way that I can tell I'm ready for the next thing? How, how would I know that it's okay to go over and kick up at the wall, for example? Um, well, it the Iyengar system, I'm not trying to do a big promotion here, but the idea of levels really comes from that system, which they usually have a level one, a level two, and a level three, which is very advanced. Um, and we have five levels. We've just basically added, we've stretched out the beginning levels. So we have more, more places for people to move, even as they're still not advanced. Um, and so hopefully you find a teacher who, who doesn't just have, you know, a boot camp setting where everybody's thrown in and expected, expected to, to push themselves really hard. Um, that, that, like I said, that's fine for some people, but um, if you're more deconditioned um, and find a teacher that actually has levels and start, you know, talk to them, what's the right level for you? And then what we tell our students is when you can do most of the poses, almost all the poses that we teach at that level, you feel confident, you feel strong, you're not shaking, you're not falling out of the balance poses, um, then it's time to consider the next level. But if you're still really shaky, or you don't want to do the whole thing and you go and lie down instead of um, doing the pose, then don't move. Yeah. You know, in my practice, I had uh, before I had a big accident and then I had after I had a big accident. My accident had nothing to do with yoga, but it did change everything about my body and my practice. Before my accident, even if I wasn't comfortable, I would have gone and kicked up at the wall and made a, made a point of it. After my accident, when they went to the wall, I would do my physical therapy and sit in the center of the room and go, not for anyone am yeah. I going over there and doing that. I think part of it is people have to be comfortable to own their own practices. I'm such a yeah. strong believer in that and to just yeah. know that's not for me. Again, when you look at the yamas and the niyamas, one of them is honesty. And I think, again, honesty starts at home. To be able to be honest about who I am today in this body is a gift. Mm -hmm. This is who I am today. This is what I can do with competence, not hurting myself today. And then hopefully you have a good teacher that says, great, we're going to start here. And now here's the next step that you can start working on rather than saying, this is where I am today. Well, now we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, to me, there's a wonderful integrity and there's a wonderful peace about the honesty of who I am today not who I was 20 years ago or who I would have been if only I had been doing two hours of asana practice every day. I mean, this, this is who I am. And to start there. Beautiful. Now you're going to teach a course for us soon on inversions. What, what will you be covering? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. Um, well, I named it, as you have, as you might guess, I named it uh, Preparation for Inversions. And this um, sequence, I think, is useful for students who um, want to find out, you know, first of all, where am I? in the path to inversions and what are the next steps appropriate for me to take. And I think the class is also useful for teachers who are looking for ideas about how to observe their students because we have lots of really good photos, really cool slides 
um, how to observe what my student is able to do now, and then how to sequence what is the next step to teach them. Um, and so we start out with some very, very easy things, even on hands and knees. Um, again, helping teachers, helping train their eye to see, um, but also for people who are really, really deconditioned. So probably some of the people that are gonna take, take the, the webinar are beyond the very beginning, beginning things, but we quickly move on to sort of the, the mid range um, and starting to get people upside down, but in controllable ways that aren't so horribly challenging. And it also helps people get over their fear of being upside down um, when you have some simple things that you can do. Um, and then we go all the way, the, the number one will be on headstand. So the preparation for and the practice of headstand. And then webinar number two is on shoulder stand. And um, how to start out, how to build up. Both of these poses require strength and flexibility and body awareness. And so taking these progressive steps is gonna help help build up. Some people who are already, you know, active and experienced yoga practitioners could go through the steps in a couple months. Other people might take a couple years. But it sounds like if I'm in a town where I can't get that teacher who can help me step up or prep yeah. for, I, I could use this yeah. to feel safe and to know when everyone else is at the wall, I'm going to be over here doing this. Yeah. Absolutely. There's, like I said, we have some really, really good photos and I make very careful descriptions of what you should be doing in each thing. And then um, if you find that you can do the hands and knees where you lift one arm, you can do that pretty good. You're not shaky or wobbly. Um, and then I'll say, okay, the next step will be to lift the opposite leg. The one thing that I, I would say is that at the very end, when it's actually time now to do headstand, we've done all this build up for it, that I have recommended that you should be with an experienced teacher when you actually make that last, get to that last final pose because somebody needs to check. You may think you have perfect neck alignment, mm -hmm. but an experienced teacher actually needs to check and make sure. Um, I was told years ago, I ha happened to have a big scoliosis and I'd been doing headstand for a long time. And a senior Iyengar teacher came over to me and said, you should never do headstand without somebody supervising you because your body is really twisted. Oh. And I, I came down and I said, I, you know, I'm a physical therapist. I know my body's twisted. I have a big scoliosis. And he said, well, you need to have a senior teacher look at you when you, when you practice headstand which I did do for a long time till I had a better sense about how I needed to support myself and orient myself. Because we get used to, our eyes will adjust. If you have a scoliosis, your eyes will adjust and, and, and fix the horizon line for you. And Yeah, and I'll tell you, Lynn, nobody comes to yoga that I've ever met that has an absolutely perfect body. Right. And I, I'll kind of kid people and I'll say, you know, we all have our stuff that we come with. I have a big scoliosis. Somebody else has a bow leg and somebody else has, you know, they got in a car accident and they stressed their neck 20 years ago. But we all have stuff that we arrive at yoga with and that we've adapted to. And sometimes it takes, you know, we, we all work carefully. And sometimes it's really useful to have a good teacher take a look at it. Awesome. Well, I know you are a very good teacher, so this is going to be an awesome class. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited about it, actually, because there's not a lot of um, systemic, uh, not systemic, system systematic, <laughs> systematic, <laughs> um, progressive kind of approaches to how to get ready for and, and very pointedly get ready for headstand and shoulder stand. Well, awesome, so, Julie. We'll see you in class. For yep. Yoga You Online, thank you for tuning in and thank you, Julie, for your generous share of information and always fascinating to talk to you.
Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. See you next time. Bye, everybody. Hope to see you in the class. <laughs> yeah.